Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Vertical Space, a podcast at the intersection of technology and flight. We are your hosts, Jim Barry and Luka Tomjanovic, and here we look at the most important forces shaping the market of advanced air mobility, with a particular focus on why and how they matter to those building a business in this very exciting and growing industry. Business aviation is about enhancing productivity and efficiency. It allows you to visit three cities in one day instead of one city in three days. It allows you to turn transportation time, travel time into productive work time. It allows you to reach places that are not well served or not served at all by commercial other airlines or other modes of transportation. So in essence, doing more in less time and doing it safely, securely, affordably, predictably, flexibly, all of those things are hallmarks of business aviation. And I think all of those are hallmarks of what we anticipate from advanced air mobility. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to The Vertical Space. Today, we welcome Ed Bolin, President and CEO of the National Business Aviation Association. As we think through what tech is going to work in our transportation system, it's so important to understand what has worked in the past and listen to how Ed envisions the role of advanced air mobility. There's a sophistication and yet a subtlety to his vision you have to listen for. I'm not going to call it out right now. You have to really listen for it. And when you hear it, it may excite you even further about the promise of AAM, but also have you realize that there's a lot of hard work to be done. At a time when so many are focusing on the building of the flying vehicles, listen how Ed also mentions what has made business aviation as vital as it is today. And if AAM wants to be successful, it should consider the ingredients of the business aviation success. You'll hear from Ed's views on the recent creation of the Bipartisan Congressional Advanced Air Mobility Caucus, just announced two weeks ago, which will help educate members about this revolutionary emerging technology. Ed also talks about the advent of different types of technology, aircraft, and types of companies, like subscription and management companies, and how companies are providing different access to the aircraft exciting opportunities for our entrepreneurs. You'll also hear Ed's three ingredients to a successful venture. And lastly, listen how Ed mentions that everyone's success depends on everyone else's success to some degree, and the importance of working together to advance advanced air mobility, Congress, manufacturers, operators, communities, and that sometimes this idea of working together isn't as obvious or intuitive for our entrepreneurs. And I may add, as mentioned from our previous guests, Although it may be more intuitive and obvious to those who've been in aviation and aerospace, it sometimes is not as obvious to those who came from Silicon Valley, who may think I'll build a better mousetrap and the world will beat a path to my door. We should be and are thankful that a person of Ed's character, perspective, and capability is a foundational leader in our transportation and aviation system. Thanks again, Ed, for joining us. And to our guests, enjoy the show. This episode of the Vertical Space Podcast is brought to you by UAvionics. UAvionics is the leader in low size, weight and power certified avionics for manned, unmanned and advanced air mobility aircraft. Let UAvionics help you achieve your goals, whether that be type certification, airspace access or beyond visual line of sight operations. UAvionics has certified and certifiable communications, navigation and surveillance avionics for your aircraft. So head over to uavionics.com or Google it to see how you can start flying safer and move your platform forward into shared airspace. Ed Bolin became the president and CEO of the National Business Aviation Association in Washington, D.C. on September 7th, 2004. Prior to joining NBAA, Ed was president and CEO of the General Aviation Manufacturers Association for eight years. Ed joined Gamma in 1995 as Senior Vice President and General Counsel. Gamma's Board of Directors elected him President and CEO in November 1996. In 2001, Ed was appointed by President Bush to serve as a member of the Commission on the Future of the U.S. Aerospace Industry. Established by Congress, the Commission's objectives were to study and make recommendations on ways to ensure American leadership in aerospace in the 21st century. Ed was nominated by President Clinton and confirmed by the U.S. Senate to serve as a member of the Management Advisory Council to the Federal Aviation Administration. He chaired the council from 2000 to 2004. Ed is a member of the Board of Directors at the National Aeronautical Association. He also serves on the Aviation Advisory Board of the MITRE Corporation, a federally funded research and development corporation. Prior to his association career, Ed was Majority General Counsel to what is now the Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions. 
He also served as legislative director for U.S. Senator Nancy Kassenbaum and was a key player in the passage of the General Aviation Revitalization Act of 1994. Ed received his Bachelor of Arts in Economics from the University of Kansas. He is a graduate of the Tulane University School of Law and holds a Master of Laws degree from Georgetown University Law Center. Ed, a recreational pilot, is also a competitive tennis player and former captain of the University of Kansas varsity tennis team. Ed, welcome to the vertical space and please meet uh, Luka Tomjanovic, Ed Bolin. Hi, Luka. How are you? Pleasure to meet you, Ed. Thanks for being on the show. You bet. Let me first ask right off, what is it about advanced air mobility that excites the NBAA? NBAA is about business aviation and for decades, business aviation has effectively meant on-demand air mobility. You know, if you look at it for decades, business aviation has been about getting people where they need to be when they need to be there. And through the decades, we've done that with bi-wings and monoplanes. We've done it with fixed wings and rotocraft, radial engines, pistons, turbines, fabric, metal, now composites. I think what we're looking at with advanced air mobility is a next turn in the evolution of technology. We're now looking at distributed electric propulsion. We're looking at the ability to get people closer to where they want to be when they want to be there. So I think that this is an exciting evolution in the uh, history of business aviation. And to follow up on that, Ed, where would you place the future business aviation in this new value chain of advanced air mobility? Do they resemble eVTOL operators? Do they continue with their current role and current position in the ecosystem? I think looking at business aviation in the future, advanced air mobility aircraft will help solve one of the challenges that general aviation and business aviation have today, which is often the most difficult portion of the trip is getting to the airport itself, getting to the aircraft itself. But we see advanced air mobility making that very safe, affordable, predictable, flexible. So we see it being uh, very much a complement to and add to the industry as we know it today. And if you could tell us about the NBAA and also just an overview of business aviation, the state of business aviation right now. NBAA has been around for 75 years. We came into existence just after World War II. There were a number of companies around the United States that recognized that they had built their entire business model around getting where they needed to be when they needed to be there. And so this could be oil companies getting to oil fields in West Texas. It could be newspaper distributing throughout uh, a state. Uh, just a lot of companies that realized it was important to have access to airports, to airspace, to make sure that these operations are safe and are perceived to be safe. And they're, they're operated very professionally. And our mission is to foster an environment that allows business aviation to thrive. Again, the definition of business aviation is think of on-demand air mobility, a company or an individual to get where they need to be when they need to be there using aviation technology. Ed, what kind of new business models have you seen come up in the recent years in business aviation? Well, I think we've seen over the past several years, both significant advances in the aircraft themselves and new opportunities in ways to access that aircraft. So, for example, just within the turbine area, we're seeing more models of aircraft, single-engine turboprops. We're seeing a single-engine jet, personal jet by Cirrus. We're seeing ultra-long-range aircraft, uh, like the ones recently announced by Bombardier, Gulfstream, uh, Dassault. And we're seeing investments made across the board by companies in creating more efficient, more effective aircraft, each designed to meet a specific mission need. But at the same time, we're seeing new operating access type operation. So we've, we've long had charter and fractionals. We're seeing an advent in subscription companies, growth in, in management companies. So we're seeing not just a change in the aircraft, but also in the ways people are providing access to that aircraft. 
And so it seems a natural extension of that as we move into the advanced air mobility and being able to solve that, what has been called the, the last mile type challenges associated with access to general aviation aircraft. Ed, what was your first impression, let's say 10 years ago, when this new world of AEM started coming about? Now, you're probably going to say, Jim, it started 60 years ago, right? Well, I think as we've been following the advanced air mobility, I think the focus of that has been distributed electric propulsion. And we've also seen a lot being focused on electric aircraft as well. I think a big part of that has been the advances that are taking place in battery technologies. The advances that we have seen, all of us have been able to witness in automobiles has created a a point in time where battery technologies no longer seem like that will be a impediment to going forward, that we can begin to see that the aircraft can be light, they can be safe, they can travel good distances at reasonable speeds and at a good cost. So I think some of the initial concerns are being assaged by the technologies that are coming up. And I think that what we are seeing is that you have a very clear vision being well articulated and acted upon by absolutely brilliant, passionate people. And capital is coming into the industry. And generally those are three key ingredients to anything moving forward. I think we all recall the uh, the moon launch where we had a clear goal. We had brilliant people at NASA. We had uh, a lot of capital from the government and we were able to do what a lot of people didn't think could be done. There may be some parallels here. Ed, in what way do you see major players in the business aviation ecosystem not ready for advanced air mobility? Well, I, I think the system that we have, and, I, and I'm talking regulators, operators, there is a growing awareness and an excitement about the potential. And a lot of work is going on to kind of understand how we collectively can remove barriers and actually facilitate these operations. I think that's being reflected as you see in an announcement that was recently made about the creation of the Advanced Air Mobility Caucus on Capitol Hill, where we have a bipartisan group of congressmen who have come together to say, we want to focus on this industry and find ways to facilitate it. We've seen that at the FAA with the creation of an executive council that pulls in the various lines of business at the FAA, including air traffic organization, airports, environmental policy, certainly certification and safety. Those types of things, I think, are all recognitions that we want to create an environment that allows AAM operations to thrive. There are some known things that we need to address and some unknown things that we are working through. But I think the good thing is that the community is having a robust conversation. There's a lot of enthusiasm for the opportunities here. And collectively, we hope we can bring this to market in the very near future. And Ed, what are, what are some of the ways that the industry and the ecosystem could improve? Well, I think we want to make sure that some of the infrastructure, like charging stations, are readily available. We want to make sure that the operations are safely integrated. And we want to make sure that the public is on board with what we are hoping to accomplish here. A lot of excitement, but we need to make sure that public acceptance infrastructure, both physical and human infrastructure are there. And we have a regulatory environment that can help facilitate these types of operations. Mm -hmm. Is it fair to say that most of the partnerships with eVTOL OEMs and operators are coming from commercial airlines as opposed to major players and operators and OEMs in the business aviation segment. Is that true? I'm not sure that's uh, I'm not sure that's true. Uh, let me give okay. a, a couple of examples. Clearly, in the business aviation community, we have Embraer, which is is very focused on this. Eve is focused both from a aircraft and an operational standpoint. So. There's a well-established manufacturer of a trusted name in the business aviation community being part of this. Clearly, 
Textron has made a big statement with its electric line of business and its recent purchase of Pipistrel. I think there's a lot going on within our community from the manufacturing side. And we also see from an operational side that companies like Directional Aviation, Wheels Up, and others are focused on this as well. So I I think it's kind of across the board that there is enthusiasm and interest in the aviation community, and it is not just commercial operators. Ed, when you went through your list of what makes for a successful venture, the use case would, you know, obviously a very clear use case is if, if it's not a fourth, it would be high on the list. What's the most obvious use case for advanced air mobility? Well, I know in talking to some of our operators, and let's just give an example in the New York area, that sometimes it can be challenging to get from uh, downtown Manhattan to some of the airports where our members operate. So Mm -hmm. think uh, White Plains, Teterboro, Morristown. But as you go out further, Stewart, Trenton. So some of that could certainly conceivably be facilitated through these types of operations operating in a congested area like New York City. And we see that playing out in a number of other communities, particularly where there are transportation challenges. So of course, think Los Angeles, Miami, places like that, but also an ability to to reach general aviation airports and communities in the more rural areas. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's very exciting as well. So I think those are some of the places where the business aviation community is really excited about what we're seeing. And then I think just as as a human being talking about things like organ delivery, some of the medical things that have been uh, taking place with companies, uh, particularly demonstrations that have taken place or operations that are taking place in places like Africa are uh, Mm -hmm. are very exciting. Let's say a a CEO of a a manufacturer came up to you and said, with your many years of experience in business aviation, what three pieces of advice would you give me? to make sure that we address the known knowns and the and the unknown unknowns. Well, I think what what we're seeing is that it's important for this community to to the extent possible communicate and collaborate to help shape in it, the environment in ways that open up this industry. You know, one of the strengths of General aviation through the years has been our ability to work together the manufacturers the operators, the community promoting safety, security, access. So I think there is a great deal to that. One of the reasons that NBAA is proud to host a AAM roundtable where we work with the leading manufacturers to develop ways that the government can help support the industry. That was really at the foundation of the recent legislation that has passed the House H.R. 6270, the Advanced Aviation Infrastructure Modernization Act. That was about the community coming together and looking at planning and construction grants necessary for vertiports. That type of working together is probably important and not as intuitive for entrepreneurs that generally think, I'll build a mousetrap and the world will be the path to my door. But because the infrastructure and the regulations are here, It requires uh, some working together to make sure that everybody can advance as we build an infrastructure that facilitates that. And another question, looking back into the uh, into the history of business aviation, and you've been around the industry long enough to see interesting ideas come and go, new business models that went in and out of business. What did the industry underestimate the most historically, and what did it overestimate? Looking at our industry, there has been an enormous amount of success bringing new aircraft and operating models to the forefront. We've already talked about some of the things like personal jets, a single engine, very light jet. We've talked about subscription services. I think historically, some people have suggested that very light jets were a promise that never fully materialized. But I would point out that we do have a lot of aircraft that meet that very light jet type of requirement, including the Cirrus Vision Jet. We certainly have new companies that have come into this space like Honda. And while Eclipse didn't meet the full promise, it did open an awareness that have allowed others to come in. 
And part of the challenges that happen with the very light jets is that they also kind of came into the market at a time when uh, I think there was a belief that the, uh, the cost infrastructure would go down substantially with volume. I think maybe with advanced air mobility, some of the advances with battery technology and electricity have an ability to reduce the cost and may make it much more achievable. I also think that the markets now with the technologies, as we've learned through Uber, Lyft, and others to use technology platforms for on-demand transportation, be it bicycles, scooters, automobiles, makes it a lot more real to think about using technology as it relates to business aircraft or advanced air mobility aircraft. And who's more likely to operate the AM of, of that we're envisioning? Is it going to be business aviation organizations? Is it going to be commercial airlines, for example? And what kind of entirely new organization potentially could come about to operate the vehicles? Well, it's interesting. What we're seeing from some of the manufacturers is an interest in both manufacturing and operating the aircraft, which is something that was originally envisioned going back uh, all the way to, to Boeing at its creation. I think there was an expectation that they could both build the aircraft and operate the aircraft. I think as we look at it, no one really knows how the future is going to play out. There's a lot of people that have strong ideas and are working toward that. I think you see that from companies that are saying they're going to operate their own aircraft. Some people have said that uh, they want to begin by working through deliveries or cargo deliveries. Others Mm -hmm. want to move people. Others have suggested that they're going to operate in ways that are going to be important for medical deliveries. I'm not sure we really know how that is going to work out, who the players are going to be. But again, there's a lot of activity going on here. And so whether these aircraft are operated with a person on board, whether they operate autonomously, whether they'll be moving people, whether they'll be moving cargo, who the operator will be, a lot of questions left to be answered. But you have a lot of companies that are pursuing different visions. And my expectation is that we will see not just one model that works, but multiple models that work. That's an interesting observation and uh, one that we think about often. Extending your argument a little bit further, we could reasonably estimate and assume that the models that we're seeing in development today is just version one of something Uh that will eventually need to find a good initial customer segment, good product fit, good missions, good use cases, et cetera, et cetera. So if we look at it through those lens, do you think that the first movers are disadvantaged and that the fast followers will have an efficiency and be in a better position to capitalize on the lessons learned from the first wave? Well, I think this is something just beyond aviation where there are different people that think there's an advantage to being a first mover. And I think there are others that think there's an advantage to being a uh, fast follower. And we see a couple of companies that are pursuing advanced air mobility based on their preference to either move first or to be a fast follower. So how this is going to play out, I'm not sure anybody knows, but it's exciting to see so many people are taking different approaches. Uh, what, do you, what do you think? I, I think I think in every industry you've seen different ways to move forward. And some, sometimes it has been the first mover, sometimes it has been the f- fast follower. So I'm not prepared to say in advanced air mobility, which is a better position to be. There are certainly very bright people who are betting the future of their company that they have placed the right bet on which of those to be. And uh, time will tell who's right. Ed, right now, an awful lot of focus is on the vehicle. And let's say this industry is incredibly successful in, say, five years. What hurdle will have been overcome that most people aren't thinking about today? So, for example, can you make the vehicle? Can you certify it? Can you integrate it into the airspace? Our vertiports and infrastructure, we had a great podcast last week on infrastructure in vertiports. There's a lot that has to happen there to come together you know, smoothly. And then also you have the communities, both you know, uh-huh. audio and, and visual noise. Again, super successful in five years. Which hurdle will have been most difficult to overcome that most aren't really looking at today? You know, it's interesting. Uh, I was with the head of EASA, Patrick Key, 
from the European uh, Aviation Safety Agency. And EASA has done an interesting survey and found that there is about an 80% public acceptance. There are people in Europe that are very excited about these operations. And I think that's probably a higher number than most people would think in terms of public acceptance. In Why do you think of, that's the case? Well, I think a lot of people have a deep belief in technology and technology's ability to operate safely and effectively. I think that there's a, uh, a, a feeling that mobility is important and this could be a solution for that. Interestingly enough, when it came to their environmental concerns, right. uh, I would have thought noise would be at the top of the list, but the survey in Europe showed it was actually bird strikes and harm to uh, harm to uh, birds was the was the first issue that came up. So things aren't always what they seem and things change. So as our technology continues to get better, as people interface more with technology, I think that, that you're going to see a lot more enthusiasm. And I think that enthusiasm is going to help us as we try to address the other issues, the infrastructure issues, the vertiports, the certification, and those operations. I think it all can come together, but I think what's important is nobody leaves one saying, we'll figure it out later. All of Mm -hmm. are being addressed in one fashion or the other. And that was, again, going back to the, uh, the legislation on Capitol Hill related to making sure that we have both planning and construction grants available for vertiports. What are the factors that make a business aviation operation successful and defensible from a from a business perspective today? And how does that translate to advanced air mobility? Well, business aviation is about enhancing productivity and efficiency. It allows you to visit three cities in one day instead of one city in three days. It allows you to turn transportation time, travel time into productive work time. It allows you to reach places that are not well served or not served at all by commercial other airlines or other modes of transportation. And it allows you to move products that may be too big to fit in an overhead bin or too sensitive to fit in a cargo hold. All of these things allow companies to leverage this mode of transportation to meet some portion of their transportation challenges and do so in a way that helps them thrive in a very competitive global marketplace. So in essence, doing more in less time and doing it safely, securely, affordably, predictably, flexibly, all of those things are hallmarks of business aviation. And I think all of those are hallmarks of what we anticipate from advanced air mobility. Right. And, and what, I, what, what my question was aiming at was between two business aviation operators, what are some of the success factors that make one better and more profitable than the other? For a company that has and operates their own aircraft for their own business needs, allowing them to get their employees to, uh, to different sites at different times to move equipment, they are looking for the aircraft that are able to meet their specific business needs. So are they going long distances? Are they going short distance? Do they need to carry a lot of people? Do they need to carry a few people? Those are some of the things that getting the right plane for the right mission is critically important. That's a little bit different than companies that charter aircraft or operate a fractional. Those needs for the end customer remain the same, but for the person operating the charter service or a fractional or a subscription company, it's being able to make sure that they have the aircraft available when the customers are anxious to go. And so those are some of the things that would be a little bit different between companies that are operating the aircraft more as, as we would think of a charter operation or fractional, as opposed to a company that has its own uh, would launch when, when and where they uh, want to. What is some, if somebody went and wanted to start a, a new business uh, aviation operation and they come to you and say, hey, would you like to be an investor in it? what would you be looking at to assess the long-term viability of that business? Well, I think in any business, you have to look at what is going to allow you uh, to target a market, to build a brand, to keep expenses low, to be scalable, 
all of those things we've seen are key in every marketplace. And it's certainly true of business aviation as well. You want to offer safety, security, flexibility, affordability. You want to do all of these things in a way that build trust, that create positive experiences and create brand loyalty. A lot of companies have been successful at bringing new entrants into the marketplace and building on those things that people are looking for in any investment is, did I get my value? Were my expectations not just met, but exceeded? And companies that are able to reach people, give them something that they may not have known that they wanted or needed and do it in a way that is just a very positive experience. Those are some of the things that allow companies to uh, enter a business and grow. When you think about advanced air mobility, what company or companies do you think have done it right? There are a number of companies in advanced air mobility that are making enormous progress. You've certainly seen that in their ability to be able to be recognized by the Department of Defense in their Agility Prime program. There are a number of companies which have been able to secure substantial investment from very recognized names, whether those be uh, cargo carriers, commercial airlines, automobile companies. We've seen that a lot of people outside of the general aviation world are very enthusiastic about the ability of these companies to develop the aircraft, certify the aircraft, operate the aircraft and grow and develop a uh, significantly large marketplace. The, those, have, those have included some very uh, far-sighted and very sophisticated investors. Let's see a congressman calls you up and said, uh, Ed, I, I'm trying to figure out whether I should support advanced air mobility or not. I've been, uh, we've been reaching out to Congress to make sure that they, uh, that they know that they should be enthusiastic about advanced air mobility. Mobility is key to uh, transportation systems and the economy. Throughout history, countries that have been able to efficiently move people and products have been rewarded. And we've seen that through history, uh, looking at the great port cities, the great rail cities, the great interstates, uh, and the great airports. This is an opportunity to continue to build on that. And so I think it is something that we all want. And the, the exciting thing about it is it doesn't take a huge amount of investment in infrastructure. You know, we always talk about how airports or runways are able to take people anywhere in the world, as opposed to a, a mile of highway or a mile of railway that only get you a mile. A runway can open up the world for you. And I think we're seeing that with the advanced air mobility. It can be an even smaller place. A vertiport can open up the world and it connect can connect communities that may have been left out by some of the infrastructure systems, uh, transportation infrastructure of the past. What would be a question, question that would show they uh, know what the future is and they understand some of the challenges these guys are going to be facing? I think they would be asking how they can work with the industry to make the benefits of advanced air mobility widely understood from all mm -hmm. of their constituency. You know, what we've seen historically is maybe there's a sense that the transportation systems are not going to be as inclusive as they mm -hmm. could be. I think that's where there's a real excitement and opportunity with advanced air mobility that it's pretty easy with, with a small amount of physical space to create access for everyone everywhere. We're at a dinner party and somebody walks up to you and says, what one new opportunity would come for entrepreneurs with an advanced air mobility that not everybody's talking about? What would you tell them? Well, people are talking about advanced air mobility at cocktail parties, I think, as different companies have gone public. Yeah. Uh, there is a lot of enthusiasm here. And the questions are, you know, how are these aircraft going to be used? And I think the reality is they're going to be used in a myriad of ways. We've touched on medical deliveries, cargo deliveries, using it to help people move both within urban areas and to more remote and rural areas. They can also be complementary to other modes of transportation. We've talked about how you can go from a city center to general aviation aircraft, get on an aircraft that can take you halfway around the world seamlessly, predictably. Um, so I think there are lots of different ways to do it. And for companies that are individuals who are looking to invest in the industry, there are an awful lot of options out there 
for people to think about. And what would, advice would you give to the young, young entrepreneur that you would not have otherwise said more than 10 years ago? What does this new industry give to the young entrepreneur? Well, I think it gives them uh, an opportunity to, uh, to change mobility as we know it, it's going to take a lot of people working in the industry. So I think a lot of times entrepreneurs focus exclusively on what they're doing. But in this case, it's not just getting the aircraft, but having the physical infrastructure, the regulatory environment. So pursue your goal, pursue the dream, but recognize that there is a bigger community here and everybody's success depends on everyone else's success to some degree. If you fast forward five years and 10 years, what does the business aviation industry look like? Well, I think it looks enormously diverse, even more diverse than it is now. It will certainly include advanced air mobility aircraft, electric airplanes. We'll be flying a lot on sustainable aviation fuel. There will be a a sharp focus on the potential of hydrogen operations as well. All of which is to say that I think in the future, business aviation will be even safer, more secure, flexible, and sustainable than it is today. Pilot shortages, uh, does advanced air mobility help or hurt and why? I think advanced air mobility helps enormously in terms of attracting people to our industry. Clearly, technology is firing the imagination of young people. We see them being inspired by drone operations, commercial space launches, and advanced air mobility. And I think that gives us an opportunity to attract and develop and retain a whole new generation of people that may not have thought about aviation as a place for them to spend their careers. So I think that the uh, the opportunities are helping us to attract a lot of people. And, uh, you know, as we move forward, these are operations that may allow people an opportunity to learn to fly cheaply and quickly, something that is not necessarily associated with today's pilots. And certainly there are a lot of companies have a strong belief in autonomous operations, uh, which will be another thing that uh, has the potential to reduce the pilot shortage challenge. What do you think is the most common misconception or misunderstanding of advanced air mobility? I think that it feels to a lot of people that it's a long way off. And I think the reality is uh, we are seeing these operations taking place today in different parts of the world. We're seeing uh, remarkable demonstrations here in the United States. The technology is getting very close. Certification is getting very close for a lot of companies. So I think the future is sooner than a lot of people think or appreciate. And which of your members will be most uh, negatively impacted by AAM? I don't know that companies are going to be negatively impacted by AAM. I think it's going to be uh, added to our community. It's going to be another tool. And a lot of times, the more tools in the toolbox, the more nodes in a system, the more valuable everything else becomes. So I talked about how companies that are operating aircraft to go halfway around the world are going to be able to use advanced air mobility to solve some of their challenges getting from the city center to the airport. I think those types of things suggest that we're going to open up new opportunities that are going to make existing parts of the community today even more valuable. Ed, I have seen you speak. I've seen you debate. (laughs) And uh, you are such a smooth, articulate person. (laughs) And your answers are so inclusive and uh, it's very impressive. I'm I'm trying to get you to say something that <laughs> that's uh that is uh going to uh, catch you off guard to some degree that but you're so darn polished it's impressive. <laughs> I one answer I was I I have to ask you. I I think the helico- a lot of people are saying the helicopter industry is going to get clobbered. What are your thoughts? Well, you know, I think there's a, there's a different time and a place for different types of vehicles operating differently. Uh, obviously, the, uh, the enormous payloads that are possible as a result of helicopters is something that I think will keep that, have, have a unique attribute. It's certainly a, a very proven technology and companies are using them to, you know, in operations ranging from logging to getting to uh, offshore rigs. So, I think there will continue to be a uh, a place for 
uh, helicopter operations. And I suspect that as we learn to use distributed electric propulsion to reduce some of the uh, and mitigate the, the, the noise challenges, that will be positive for everybody because it will create even more public acceptance for things flying overhead. Just to follow up on this, Ed, if you think about the use cases and missions that helicopters conduct today, Mm -hmm. what's your rough estimate in in percentage of how much of that mission set will be taken over by advanced air mobility vehicles? You know, I don't think I have uh, thought through it in, in that detail to put percentages on that. So I think part of it will deal with What type of range do we have? How does that match up? Whether it's pipeline inspection, things like that, kind of depends on uh, what you are going to be able to look at in terms of time in the air and and, and range of operations. So, uh, you know, with the the expected trajectory by the end of this decade, do you think it'll be more than 50% or less than 50%? I'm just not sure about that. Ed, is there a question you were dying to answer that we haven't asked? No, I, I think it's been a been a good full hour. I've appreciated the opportunity to talk with you. If you were uh, asked to summarize either your viewpoint at AAM or summarize the podcast, how would you do it? AAM is one of the most exciting things that we've seen in aviation, maybe since the dawn of the jet age. We have seen that breakthroughs in propulsion have been important for expanding mobility and bringing people into aviation. And I think this is this is really something exciting when you look at the ability to go with really high degrees of safety, security, affordability from very small places to another. Looking at just the size of a vertiport, this is an exciting dawn to a new age in aviation. Great. Ed, Ed Luke, anything else from you? No, thank you so much, Ed. Thanks. Thanks for a lovely discussion and for being on the show. I've, I've enjoyed it immensely. Hope, uh, <laughs> hope to do it again sometime. Thanks, Ed. Good talking with you. All right, that's a wrap for today. Thank you for listening to the Vertical Space Podcast. Reach out if there are topics that you would like us to discuss and goodbye until the next episode. Unless mentioned, this podcast is in no way endorsing or promoting any person and or company mentioned and all opinions within the podcast are solely that of the presenters. The Vertical Space makes no guarantees, warranty or representation of any information given in this podcast. Any information given is for informational purposes and should be used at your own risk. This podcast is for general, educational, and entertainment purposes only.